about one minute to go to say um, before I get started, there are, I know the room is kind of wide, and so there is, uh, there will be some code and things on the slides, but if you have trouble seeing anything, all these slides are already up and online, so uh, if you watch either for the Build Stuff hashtag or if you watch uh, me on Twitter, I'll tweet the link out so you can get the slides afterwards if you want. Uh, okay, so we'll get going. My name is Jeff Strauss. Um, I am uh, clearly not from here. Uh, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, which is kind of right in the middle of the United States. Um, do a bunch of different things. Uh, I'm involved in conferences myself. Uh, John Mills, who's also here, uh, and I, we both run an event called the Kansas City Developer Conference. And we do a lot of talks about uh, JavaScript and various other businessy and legal type things. Now, I like to get started usually kind of with a bit of a story to talk about kind of where we're coming from, why we're here, and why this is sort of, I think, interesting. Um, does anyone know what that is? A CPU. That's a CPU, yeah. It's the inside, right. So it is a, it specifically is a 286. It's an, it's an 8286. Uh, anyone old enough to remember having a computer that had one of these in it? It's okay if you, <laughs> not very many, sweet. All right, cool. So I'm old and you all aren't. Cool, so that's fantastic. So the 286 was, uh, came out in the early 80s, and that series of Intel processors um, was sort of what I grew up with, okay? And it lived in a computer that looked sort of like this. Uh, I had a computer that looked almost exactly like that. Uh, amazing machine, amazing machine. Uh, it, it had like 25 megahertz on that processor, had multiple different kinds of floppy drives, a megabyte of RAM, and 40 whole megs of persistent hard drive space. It was an amazing computer. You could do things with it, like, a, oh, and best of all, it was cheap. That was for, you know, for the low, low price, about $1,500 US is what that machine would cost. But you could do amazing things, like play Ultima games and other old games like that, or even run, like, Windows from your DOS prompt. It did amazing things at the time. Now, the thing about CPU technology and how it advanced over the years is that, you know, really Windows 3.1 ran more on a 386 maybe than a 286, but over the course of several years, by the time we got to, uh, say, around the early to mid-90s, we had gone all the way to the point where we, had a, where we had a Pentium, right? Who remembers the Pentium processor? Any of you have that? A f yeah, all right. Here's the thing about the Pentium. We were getting, we're up to talking about like gigahertz now, right? We were talking about more RAM in these machines, more powerful things, and modems. And what happened is, even though it was only a few years later, that thing was eight times more powerful than the 286 we had just a few years earlier. That surprises nobody, right? No one is surprised by how much that happens. And largely, we aren't surprised because of this guy. Anybody know who that is? Yeah. Okay. So Gordon Moore, uh, Gordon Moore, people have heard of Moore's Law, right? Uh, what did, so you know, so what did Moore's Law, what did it tell us? Uh, doubling of CPU power uh, every 18 months. Right, so he said doubling of CPU power every 18 months. Almost. That's what most people think that it said. What Gordon Moore really said in the mid-1960s, he was one of the co-founders of, uh, of, of Intel. And what he predicted is that the number of transistors available on an integrated circuit would double every two years. That was the original prediction, and then it actually accelerated over time before it started to decelerate. Now, that held true for a while. The transistor, right, is, uh, you know, if you watch how these CPUs are built, they're amazing. If you've never watched, you should watch how a CPU is actually created and how they take the silicon and they make these wafers. I mean, it's an incredible process. But on all sorts of these, on every one of these little chips, we have these transistors. And so this is actually a picture of the transistors from an 8080 from the mid-1970s. Six microns is small, right? A human hair is about 50 microns across. So this is small. This is small. But what's happened over time is we're starting now to talk about seeing three nanometer architecture. So that is 2,000 times smaller per gate per transistor than we had in the mid-1970s. And the problem with that 
is eventually, right, we're talking 10 atoms across. And so what we start to see is we have issues with quantum tunneling. And, and are people familiar with that idea? Anyone seen this, right? Where we're, we're expecting that these electrons and particles will flow through these gates. But we're getting to the point where the gates and the, and the transistors are so small that sometimes through, I'm not a quantum physicist, but these things will actually appear on the other side of the gate. We start having errors because, because physics. I don't understand the physics well enough to explain that other than that's a thing. What that means is we can't keep making the transistors smaller. We can't keep making the CPUs faster. So what do we start doing? How do we start handling that? Right. More cores. That's great. It lets us build faster applications. It lets us harness the technology we have, do things more, increase our computational power. And if you're a .NET developer, who's a .NET developer in here? Right on. Me too. Okay. If you're a .NET developer or a Java developer or a lot of other things, that's wonderful because we have tasks and threading. And what about JavaScript? So, right, JavaScript, famously, single-threaded. Here's the thing, I will put to you that that is a lie. It's not the truth. It, it's sort of the truth. It's kind of the truth. It is true that the event loop is single-threaded. It is true that in a web browser context, in a given JavaScript context, that execution context is single-threaded. It does not mean that our applications have to be single-threaded. It does not mean that there aren't APIs and tools available to allow us to have thread-like paradigms in our applications. Really what it means is that the, the ECMAScript standard, which is the specification that JavaScript is built upon, does not define a threading model. Okay. Okay, so what we can do is find ways, even today, to have plenty of concurrent application development and even some parallel processing, and they're not the same thing. So concurrency is not a new topic in JavaScript. And concurrency does involve things like multiple processes and threads. Now, to quickly sort of talk about these two ideas and where we're coming from, Let's imagine we have, uh, you know, we, have, we have Betty, and Betty owns a restaurant. And that restaurant sells steaks and salads and has customers. It's a very simple restaurant, steaks and salads. And she has to manage customers all by herself. So she goes, and she's going to go heat up an oven, right? But she's got to wait. So I'm going to go, and I'm going to get the oven started. And what does Betty do? She doesn't stand there and wait. She goes over and says, well, while the oven's heating up, I'm going to go and make the salad and get that ready. And then ding, it's ready. So I'm going to go back to, the, uh, back to the oven, throw the meat on the grill. And in the meantime, she's got to also remember to go out to the, to the floor of the restaurant and talk to her customers, figure out what's going on, and communicate with these people. So she's doing things concurrently, right? A single actor, a single person, doing multiple things at the same time, just not really at the same time, right? In a perfect, ideal world, this is fine, this is great, this is easy. It's only a few things. She just goes around, except what happens if it takes longer than expected to make the salad, or the customer is upset about something that's taking long to get orders, and meanwhile the steak burns, you know, like bad things can happen. The customer leaves, because maybe you can't always juggle things at the same time. So maybe instead, what Betty does is she goes and she hires people to work for her, and now she has another chef who manages taking care of the steaks. She hires a maitre d' or a host, or she hires right, right, uh, the waiters to handle the, the restaurant. And now this, this restaurant, which we'll call parallelism, is handling multiple things at once, literally and truly at once. This has historically been a little harder to do with JavaScript, but still actually not impossible. Now, with JavaScript concurrency, where Betty is just by herself, and she's working her way around uh, the, the kitchen and the floor of the restaurant, we've, we've had all these kinds of things for some time, and callbacks are not new, right? And the Promise API has been around for a few years, async await, those are concurrency. 
Right? That's those are concurrent models with JavaScript. And the way they happen is generally historically through the event loop. Okay. Who's familiar with the event loop? A handful of people. So here's kind of how this works today. And it's important to kind of talk through it to make sure that um, we're all kind of on the same page as to why we care about finding better, newer ways to sometimes have threads in our applications. So say we have a kind of a simple application, and we'll walk through it. I know that, like I said, on this side, it might be harder to see the bottom part. But we'll talk through what's going to happen here. Is really what we're doing is we're logging out a start and an end. We're going to have some sort of a callback with a set timeout. And in the middle of that, we're going to add a couple numbers together and output that as well. Right. Um, first off, what we have when any time a JavaScript application is running with the event loop, we have a few important pieces. We have a call stack. We have external APIs, calls to other browser APIs, which, by the way, uh, we were talking at lunch about exactly this. Set timeout. Set timeout is not actually part of JavaScript. Right? Like set timeout is an external API in the browser. It is not part of the JavaScript spec. Okay, so we have external APIs, and we have a queue that sits outside of these things. So we say console log start. We already have demo running, and this is just a call stack, a traditional simple call stack. So we're going to do that. We're going to log something out. Now we're going to call set timeout. Set timeout is going to set a 100 millisecond timer over here. Right? So that's an external API, and it's basically a scheduler. And we say sit over there for a little while, and we keep going. Now we do some more work. We add our numbers together, and we log two. And then somewhere in between here, ding, it's ready, right? The oven's preheated. We're ready to go. So now our callback is done. It's been 100 milliseconds, so we should log callback, right? But we don't do that. The callback gets put on that queue. And when things go on the queue, the way the event loop works is nothing comes off of that queue until the call stack is empty, until the call stack is done. So now. We have to log end. It doesn't matter that we finished the, this timeout before. We have to log end first. When it's done, then we look and say, is there anything on the callback queue? And we stick that up, and we run that. Right? So the end result of that is we don't get start to callback end. Callback is actually the last thing that comes out to our console. And it doesn't matter that it took 100 milliseconds and it stopped here, if you set a set timeout to zero milliseconds, so it is done instantly, it's still an external API call, which means you have to get through your call stack first. Before that, you'll get the same result, no matter what. Okay. So the trouble here is, aside from kind of understanding how the, the, that works, we think, well, that's fine. Like, that's cool. I really just like cats. Um, we think, that's cool, um, ex except just because we understand it doesn't necessarily mean that it's OK and we can always program around that. Because what happens if instead of adding 1 plus 1 and logging 2, we have some kind of big piece of blocking code? Long running process, heavy computational load, image processing, fetching a massive amount of data, something. And it sits in blocks. So now our 100 millisecond timer or our zero millisecond timer or whatever goes to the callback queue and it sits and it sits and it waits and then it waits some more. And this whole thing is going on on the call stack and it never ends and eventually you get to see this guy. And we never want to see that guy. But there's nothing we can do about it, right? Well, wrong. Has anyone worked with web workers before? Like three or four people. Cool. That's good. No, that's actually, this is really good. So web workers attempt to solve this problem. And it's kind of the, one of the original ways we attempted to solve this problem with JavaScript. It, they aren't new. Right? Web workers were first kind of implemented in browser, I believe, in around 2009. So it's not a new idea. But how they work, they're just like set timeout. The worker, the web worker API is an external browser API. It's not part of JavaScript. It's not part of the ECMAScript spec. It's an external API that you can call. And it's really simple. I mean, it's really simple. You say new worker, right? You assign var or whatever, or let, let worker equal new worker, and you pass in, at its simplest, you pass in the name of some script file. That's it. 
I mean, like, it's not really it, but like, that's it. Because what happens now is that worker, each one of those that you spin up gets its own execution context. That worker is another execution context for JavaScript to manage and run another script somewhere else in its own process with its own thread of, of allocated resources to do its thing. So now, and they're real threads, they're, they're operating system level threads that are being allocated to your worker. So once you create that, you can work with it. And there's just a, really a couple of methods that you're going to care about. So you create a worker, and we'll kind of step through an example in a second, but you create a worker, and that worker has a couple of sort of global level functions or, as, associated with it. One is posting a message. So it's a messaging sort of protocol. That worker has messages that pass data back and forth. And the other is its own event, the message event. So you can either say like self.addEventHandler and add the message handler, or you can just say on message and assign an event handler for that message that handles when the data or the message is posted. So how does that work? Again, sorry, but uh, assume we have two different scripts, very simple scripts. One is main.js, one is work.js, because worker didn't fit there with my font. So one is main and one is work. This is our main application. We're going to do a few things. First, like I said, we're just going to say new worker, and we're going to pass that script file in. Right? So now I have a worker thread, a worker process, that is executing this guy while my application on the main UI thread, my main application thread, is busy doing its work over here. As soon as I execute that line, while stuff continues happening over here, over here, the thread spins up and it just starts executing code. And all that we have to do over here on this side, on message and post message are, are kind of global attributes of the worker itself. So we have to, you could say self dot on message, but you say on message equals, and we're going to give it an event handler, which we'll come back to, because it's going to post something back, and we'll look at that. But that's all that happens on the work side for now, is we're going to create an event handler. Wait for that one to come back. In the meantime, back on our main thread, we're going to attach an, a message handler to this guy as well, because I got to talk back and forth. So the worker. For this specific, right, let w equal, so w is my worker. For this worker, when I receive a message back, I'm going to do the following thing. I'm going to simply say worker says e.data. So e is just the event uh, object that comes back with the message event, and it has a data property that is the thing that was posted. So in this case, e.data is whatever got posted from the other side. So I'm going to log out worker says e.data. And then once that's all set up, I'm going to tell my worker, I'm going to post a message, talk to me. As soon as that happens, this fires off. So my worker has been sitting here just waiting. It's running, it's executing on a background thread, and it's just waiting for its turn. It says, oh, talk to me. All right, so I got something. So now it does the same thing over here. I'm literally, it's a very simple, dumb example application. I realize it doesn't do very much, right? But it illustrates the point. Over here, now it wakes up. It got a message, so I'm going to say that main says e.data. And then I'll post the message back, here I am. The end result of all of that is you have the worker putting out to the console that the main said, talk to me. And then the main thread says that worker says, here I am. Does all make sense? There's a lot of use cases for this kind of stuff. Because like I said, the problem is we have the blocking code problem with the event loop. So if web applications historically, I, this isn't even true. I always want to say historically we didn't have to worry about these things and that web apps are trying to do more today. But that was really never the case. We've always had some problems with non-responsive UIs and issues with the DOM and, and websites getting hung up because of whatever processing is going on. So, but, but in particular, things like spell checking, like live spell checking in a web application, it says some of these things already. If you're handling a lot of data, image processing, prefetches, or especially long-running type calculations that are processor intensive, things that have a heavy load, or things that maybe have a lot of spin up and a lot of memory use or wasted effort to spin up and tear down all the time. You can instead take that thing, put it in a worker, and let it sit there and run and respond to messages when they're needed. I'd like to say it's that easy and that's all there is to it, but it's not. Because of or we'd be done. So, one thing is cleanup. What do you do with these things? Because now we have threads sitting out there. 
um, how are we going to handle that, right? Because now I say, I spin up a worker, and I may not just spin up one. Depending on the kind of application, I may spin up a whole lot of workers. These can all work together, right? I can have a bunch of workers that all talk to each other. I might have a lot of threads going on, and now all of a sudden, what was my nice, simple, clean web application that was single-threaded, just had one event loop, has a lot of resource usage going on. When does it go away? Because it, you know, it doesn't necessarily go away just because it's done executing itself. Remember, work.js only had like effectively one expression in it, which was set up an on-message event handler. Then it was done. But it has to stay alive, right? People are listening to it. Or it's, I'm sorry, it's listening to the main thread for messages. So it doesn't go away on its own. So there's a few easy ways to do it. One is that the worker itself has a close function. Just close. So you can tell the worker, do your thing, and when you're done, close yourself. And it goes away. Or externally, if I'm in, say, main.js, I can directly tell my worker to terminate itself. So it's close if I'm inside the worker, like self.close, or it's worker.terminate, w.terminate, in our example before, to shut yourself down. Right, so we can either do it this way, with close, or this way, telling it to terminate. Now, the thing about terminate is that it's immediate. It's done. The worker's in the middle of doing something, don't care. Doesn't matter. Stop everything, shut yourself down. And it goes away. What's more is once it's gone, it's gone. So that doesn't mean you can't spin up another worker, right? You can create a new worker again, pass the script in again. But if you had, say, internal variables and things you were keeping track of inside the original worker, once it's closed, you're not going to reopen it. So you don't just want to, like, terminate on a whim. So you need to manage these things. How do you tell if it's closed? You ask it if it's closed, right? You say, is, this, is it closed? <laughs> yeah, you, 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 can't, you can't do that um, because, because JavaScript. So <laughs> there is no simple way. There is no simple way. Um, that doesn't mean it can't be done, but it means you need to think about it. If you're going to need to be constantly polling, for example, and say, is this thing still active? You may need to either create your own properties on your worker or have something that you can call into or some way to tell, keeping in mind, of course, that once you tell it to terminate, you can't access that thing anymore. Right? But you also can't tell if worker is, it doesn't just go away, because terminating or, or, or closing the worker doesn't make it undefined. It doesn't make it null. It just makes it, so, like it's still a variable that's in scope. You just can't talk to it anymore. Because there's the worker, which is kind of the, the surrounding sort of package that holds that script, and then there's the script itself that's gone. But the worker hasn't gone anywhere. So it's not, not great. Not great. But here's the other thing to remember is that uh, who thinks that all browsers work together really well and all function the same way? Good. All right. So we're on the same page there. Because um, they clearly don't. And just like I said, yeah. Yeah. Node.js. So Node.js is like a whole different set of things. Um, Node.js, and, and I'm more of a web guy directly than a Node guy in terms of like what I do every day. What Node has been looking at and talking about, and I don't know if it's actually like live and full on release, is Node is looking at other ways of handling uh, some threading. Uh, and it, right, yeah. that's right. But it's not the same. Yeah, it's not the same. Right. So they're supported, but it doesn't really work the same, it doesn't exactly work the same way as it would in a web browser. Uh, that's a good question, though. So, so here's the thing about these is just like set timeout, the, uh, this, is a, this is an external API, meaning it's not part of the spec. It's implemented browser by browser. So you have to, <laughs> and we love when JavaScript works that way. Um, so you have to sort of be aware. Because, and the reason I bring that up is because, yeah, you can call close or terminate, but the thing is, you can't necessarily trust when the thing will go away. So you still need to manage that and come up with a way to terminate and close your workers down because 
while the browsers do have garbage collection and they do have ways to clean these things up when they're gone, like some browsers say that when you close the web page that spawned the, the worker, the worker should go away. But there's no, strict method, like, there's no strict way on how and when that happens and exactly where. So just because you close your app, once you close your app, uh, maybe the worker goes away, maybe it doesn't. So you do need to make sure that you basically like, clean up after yourself. I have two young kids. This is not either of their rooms. Um, it looks a little like my son's sometimes. But uh, you need to clean up after yourself because if you just leave it out there, you don't know when garbage collection is going to come and clean these things up for you. So you need to manage them. The other thing is there's limits on how you can use them. So you can pass a lot of data back and forth to a web worker. Right? You can pass in, it doesn't have, you know, I was using simple strings, but you can pass objects back and forth. But you can't pass certain things. You can't pass DOM elements back and forth. You can't pass anything that's in the global or window scope. You can't see parent functions of the things you pass back and forth. The DOM thing is the most important because one of the reasons that the worker API kind of came into existence in the very beginning was because of the blocking issues with UIs. So the main thread is still managing the DOM. The main thread is still in charge of rendering the stuff on the DOM. You can't even pass DOM nodes in. If you want to manipulate the DOM with the worker, you can do that, but you have to pass the underlying data and then pass it back to the main thread and let the main thread render once the heavy lifting has been done. How do we communicate some more with these things? So I already kind of talked about this a bit. I said, oh, we share this data, right? We pass a string, you know, talk to me, or here I am, or here's an object with a lot of stuff I want to pass to a worker. So we share the data, right? Except we, we, we don't share the data. There is no data sharing with web workers. It's another important thing to think about in terms of when you're deciding whether you want to use them. What you're really doing is copying the data. It's a messaging system, and it's not transferring and it's not sharing, right? So if I have a large object and I need to put something and give it to a worker and pass it back and forth regularly, bear in mind that every time I'm doing that, I'm cloning the data. I'm not just giving a handle. It's never being passed by reference, at least not by default. So if we go back to the main JS and work JS for a second, let's use something a little and only just barely more, more interesting than strings, is if I pass an object in instead that has X and Y, that's just two numbers. All right, so I have foo, that's x and y, and that's what I post. And over here, I do something with foo. It doesn't matter, right, because I'm not actually passing foo. I'm taking foo, I'm making a clone of it, and e.data has that clone. I can create my own variable called foo, but that variable foo is scoped to this worker. It's scoped, and I can manipulate it and do stuff with it, and I can pass it back, but when I pass the manipulated version of foo back, I pushed the wrong way, sorry and I want to compare the two, the one I get back from my worker is going to have 42, but the one that I always, already had has a 1. Right? So you have to think about that too. Not only because you have to remember and actually like, do stuff with it, but you've got to think about the implications of sending things that, are, that have a bigger memory footprint than 1 and 2, or the string here I am. You've got to think about what you're actually passing around. And what it uses is a, like a structured clone algorithm, and all that really means is it's a deep clone of the object that you pass. But it does a few extra things. So it keeps track, for example, of mapping when a given property has already been hit and cloned. So things like self-referencing or cyclical references are okay because the cloning algorithm knows that you've already, you've already cloned this piece of data. If this piece references this piece, it will, and you have a circular reference back, the cloning algorithm that it uses is smart enough to know better. Yes. If using immutable data structures, uh, if they're immutable, yes, because you're just you're cloning into something new, right? You're, so as you're not modifying the original. Now, obviously, if you're doing something with it and passing it back, like we had in that last example, it'd be a problem because you're not going to update back in the original structure. But yes. Um, again, there are limitations. So. You still can't do anything with a DOM. The structure cloning algorithm will not clone a DOM node. It will not clone an error of function uh, object. It will actually give you an error. It'll say data clone error, and you'll get that back, and it will not work. 
Uh, it also doesn't go up the prototype chain, and it doesn't clone the descriptors themselves. So it's not that deep of a deep clone. So when you have like an enumerable descriptor or a uh, like a mutable, de like a writable descriptor on a property, that itself doesn't get copied over. So to your point, right? If you've written something and you have an object that is immutable, or you have a descriptor that's uh, that on a property that is not writable, that descriptor doesn't make it into the worker. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> what if you copy a frozen object? What if you pass the frozen object into a Well, you're not passing the object in. Is it going to stay frozen? I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to look it up when we're done. I don't know. Uh, yeah, the so the question was, if, like, if you have, like, object.freeze on a thing and then pass it in. Um, I want to say no, <laughs> but I don't know. I'm going to look it up, and then I'm going to post the answer. That's a really good question. No, does anyone else know the answer to that? Do you know the answer to that? Okay, I don't know. All right, so I said we're sharing data. Well, we're not sharing data, we're copying data. And I said we're not transferring data, and I lied to you again. Uh, you can transfer data. It's just not the default. And when I say you can transfer data, only very limited types of data. So. Remember we had post message before and I just post foo, right? I can post an object or some data over to my worker. Well, I can also post foo and then a list of objects that are transferable. Now, transferable is a new, uh, like a new interface that, or, well, it's really not that new, that says um, it's a specific kind of thing that lives on top of an array buffer, like a byte array. So if I create a byte array, does anyone work with byte arrays? When I say that, do we know what we're talking about? Okay, only call people. So a byte array, like, is more very explicitly structured, fixed length generic data where I can write and talk directly to like the addresses, like an index of bytes that I can talk to and read and write from. Not the kind of thing you use in your everyday work, but if you're doing things like image processing and that kind of stuff or heavy computational loads, that might also be the kind of work you end up needing to do. So what, what happens here is, let me see here, at the very top, well, let me go back here. At the very top, I have an array buffer, and that array buffer is 1,024 bytes. It's a kilobyte of memory. It's all it is, a fixed length piece of memory as an array. Now, I can pass that thing in. I still have to create an object, so I create foo. My event.data does not have to be that array buffer. I create foo, I give it whatever other properties I want, and I make sure that that buffer also exists in my object. It doesn't have to be one thing. It can be a bunch of different things. I can have four different array buffers if I want that serve different purposes all in this object. And the only difference now is when I call post message, I post all of foo, and after that I say, and here's a list of some of the things that are in foo that are transferable. If I do that, what ends up happening is uh, now, instead of doing a deep clone, or a structured clone, the actual array itself, that buffer exists in the worker as a full transfer. Now that's great because it is faster. It's great because I don't have multiple copies of this thing using up memory. On the other hand, um, you can only use it on those array buffers and image bitmap type things. The way, so what really happens with an array buffer is you take it and then you put a view over it and you say, I've got a ki one kilobyte of memory and I want to use it for say, an array of int 32 and then I get to address those things and I have a certain number of ints. But not only that, it's still only one thread at a time, so we're not sharing, we're not sharing it, we're transferring it, right? So I'm taking this original piece of data and my main thread is posting it over to my worker, my worker is receiving it, and my main thread can no longer see it. Makes the thread safe, I guess. And then you can pass it back from the worker to main. But no two threads can actually see it at the same time. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Can a worker spawn other workers? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, broadcast channels. Broadcast channels are like workers. Kind of. They have a very similar API. 
But broadcast channels are more for actually having a shared context. So and what I mean by that is, even though we can spin up all these different threads and all these different workers, you still have like, here's your window, here's your browser, here's your application that's running right now. And it can have 10 different workers and 10 different threads doing things, but they're all living inside this one, this one web app. And this one web app knows how to talk to all those workers, but nobody else does. Broadcast channels change that. What broadcast channels do is instead of creating a new worker, I'm going to create a new channel. And I'm going to give it a name. I'm just going to call it, I'm just going to call it Foo. Okay. When I create that channel, and I can have multiple different main threads, multiple different pages, all executing, and they can all create a broadcast channel, and they can all call it Foo. They don't have to. They can call them other different, you know, different things. But every single, uh, every single execution context that creates a channel that is called Foo is talking to the same channel. So now, I don't have to use the name Foo again. Foo is just the name when I put it in the constructor. But when I say channel on message, I'm saying I'm just listening on the Foo channel. It's more of like a pub sub type thing. I'm listening on the Foo channel. I am posting a message to the Foo channel to whomever is listening. So, um, <laughs> so <laughs> I have a teammate who I love dearly. And uh, so I look at his browser sometimes. Like, hey, can you look at this thing? And I'll look over at his browser, and he has like 900 tabs open. I think, man, like, how is your machine not on fire? Um, but if you have a bunch of tabs open, if your application, maybe it's an internal like line of business application, who knows, and you have things happening in multiple contexts, what the broadcast channels do is they support tabs and other workers, which means that if I am sitting there in that with, uh, let me go back, in this situation, and I have an app running in this tab and this tab and this tab, the one that's here can create the Foo broadcast channel. So can these two. These two can listen on that channel, this one can broadcast something on this channel, and all of them can respond. So it's cross-tab. It's like a cross-tab worker. Now, that's cool. Just make sure that you follow the same origin policy, and, and I think that's a reasonable thing to expect, right? So what I mean by that is I can't have a broadcast channel that is spawned from, some, from a script that's running on google.com and then also have something that's on stackoverflow.com create the Foo broadcast channel. They cannot talk to each other. It's just like any other issue with cores. If I have cross-origin, it will not work. So what the broadcast channel does is any execution context you have from the same origin can create a, a broadcast channel with the same name, and they all talk to each other. Make sense? OK. And the other thing to remember is that it is still copying, not sharing, not transferring. So bear in mind that if you open 10 different tabs and you create 10 different broadcast channels and you want to talk to all of them when you post those messages, you are cloning all that data into every one of them, which could have performance implications, memory footprint implications, things like that. So it's still not perfect. Now, what about shared memory? Because that's something we haven't done yet. We keep, we keep talking about like, copying and cloning data, structured clones, transferring data. The one thing we haven't really done that is somewhat like a hallmark of, uh, of true threaded, threaded applications is that we can actually share and talk to the same memory at the same time. Now, a lot of people who are long-time either proponents of JavaScript or who are involved, you know, like people in TC39 who, are, who drive the spec, the JavaScript spec, there's a reason we hear all the time that JavaScript is single-threaded, right? A lot of people view that as a benefit. It's easier to, to not have to manage multiple threads, and not have to manage shared access to data all the time. But there are times when we really want to do it. Other language platforms let us. JavaScript historically has not. So uh, warning, this is a newish feature. Um, they, they, we're going to talk about kind of um, what's called shared byte arrays and atomics. Has anyone heard about these at all? Sweet, like one person. Awesome, two people. So this is a feature that unlike web workers, unlike broadcast channels, uh, which are not part of JavaScript, right? 
their browser APIs, their external APIs. Atomics and shared bind arrays that we're about to talk about are part of JavaScript. They were introduced in ES 2017, so about a year and a half ago, they were made part of the actual JavaScript spec, the ECMAScript spec. Promptly after that, right after they were finalized and went live and became an official part of the spec, they were disabled in basically every browser. And we're going to talk about why in a minute. Um, but they're coming back and they're starting to come online. So you can use them now in Chrome. It's great, actually, because the very first time I gave this talk, like they were disabled right before I gave the talk. I had this whole thing worked out and then I was like, oh, they're, oh, they're dead. They were a thing for like three minutes and then they were dead. Um, but here's what they are first. And then we'll talk about why they went away for a while and why they're coming back now. So shared array buffer, we already saw an array buffer, right, which was that sort of the list, the generic fixed length array of bytes, memory that we can directly address and talk to. This is basically the same thing, except it's specifically built to be shared across multiple threads. It is explicitly a threading mechanism that is explicitly part of the JavaScript spec. So we can continue to say that JavaScript is not multi-threaded. Now that's really a lie. I mean, now this is actually part of the standard. And the way they work is very similar to the way um, the, the, sharing, the, share, the, the sharing or transferring of data before worked. But instead of creating an array buffer of a kilobyte, we're going to create a shared array buffer of a kilobyte. And then what we do with it, and we, I didn't show this before, but this is how you would work with a, share, with a regular array buffer as well, is you don't just talk to the array buffer. The array buffer cannot be addressed directly. That's just setting aside the memory. And what you do is you put a data view over that thing. It could be an int32 array. It could be any other kind of typed array, um, in 16, in 64 type arrays that sit as views over that. So then when I address them, I'm not addressing the byte, I'm addressing the chunk of bytes, right? So I'm really addressing, uh, you know, a 32-bit chunk of that array when I want to talk to and put an int in. Now, I pass the shared buffer into here, and then I create a worker, just like I would have before. I create a new worker, I call work.js or whatever, and I post my int array, which is, has a shared array buffer underneath it. On the worker side, I'm listening on message. This part's I know really kind of faint, but this is just my message handler. It receives E, so now I'm going to say, okay, great, I have a worker int array that gets E.data, and I can do stuff with atomics. I'm going to say atomics.store on this shared array at index 42. The 40, right, the 40-second slot in that array, and set the value to 500. Okay, I can directly address that memory and put things in it. And this is a shared, shared thing that is seen by the main thread, by this worker, and by any other workers I might share and post it to. It is genuinely a single allocation of memory that can be addressed by multiple threads at the same time. The reason we have to use Atomics then is that the Atomics library is worried about thread safety. That's something we've never really worried that much about in JavaScript. Never really had to care. But atomics allow us to uh, try to protect ourselves from ourselves. So atomics handling handles like the locking of access and things like that. So for example, atomics has a handful of, of functions available off, of the, off the API. So we already saw store. There's also load. So store, which for me is really weird because I still, I hear the word load and even though I should know better, it's like you load something from disk, but I, I still hear the word load and I think I'm loading this into it. You're not. Loading is reading from it. Storing is putting a value in. So when you call atomics.load, you pass that shared buffer in and you give it an index and you get the value back. If I want to store something, you, same deal, but you also give it the new value you want to put in. And there are others as well. Um, so exchange is simply saying, I want you to take a value that already exists give that old value back to me and store something new in its place, but actually return the value. If I just do store, I don't get anything back. If you say exchange, you actually receive the value back, the old one. And then add and subtract, or just for doing like math inside the array, same thing, bitwise logic and XORs, ORs. But the point of all of these is that by using atomics, we lock the thing. So no other writes or reads can happen. Sorry? Like the and and or type things. Um, s sort of, sort of. So yes. 
So uh, yeah, that's actually in the next slide, so it's a good question. So um, I'll show you. They're similar. They're not exactly what you're saying. They're not exactly the same. But they're the closest you're going to get, per perhaps. So what will happen here, like with dot weight, finish the, let me finish the point from the last slide. The whole point of the atomics is that it's locking access, right? So as long as any of these things are going on, any of these functions or these, if I'm in the process of doing a store or an ad or an exchange or whatever, nothing else can touch it. And all the locking mechanisms are handled for you by the Atomics API. You don't have to do it. It's built in. So when I say atomics.load, it's going to go read something, and nothing can touch it and do another write on it that'll change the data while I'm in the process of reading the data until I'm done doing my load. And you don't have to handle any of the messiness that goes with the thread safety. So what weight does is it basically says, hey, put this value in, do this exchange, put this value here in this place, and wait for it. Optionally, you can provide a time for how long it waits, but otherwise it just waits forever. And sit there and go to sleep, basically, until and unless the value changes. When the value changes, wake up and do something. And you can manually override that by passing in and saying dot .notify. So it's not, I don't know if it's exactly what you're asking about, but I think that's the closest you get to it. Right, was putting a value in and saying, now that it's there, I don't want to hear from you again unless something changes. And if something does change, I need you to let me know. Does that make sense? Okay. So, <laughs> point of all that, who's heard of Spectre? All right. This, uh, this killed these things. Just killed them. <coughs> they never thought about it until after they approved it, and then they started being implemented in browsers. Um, so Spectre and Meltdown, for, uh, if, you, if you aren't familiar with them, were like all these CPU vulnerabilities and like major security vulnerabilities associated at the hardware level in these chips. And what happened was, and again, like this is not my area of like serious expertise, but they're based on very high precision, like high resolution time ba timer based attacks. Because the, uh, part of how CPUs do what they do is they employ like predictive logic. So sometimes when a CPU has to make a decision about where to go with the gate, it kind of assumes both, or it makes a prediction and then it waits, and if it's wrong, then it backtracks, but it tries to predict where to go in order to get better computation out of the chip. And so with perfect timing based attacks, a malicious actor could come in. Battery. Have a diamond mic, sell your ladder. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, what happened was that was hard to do until we had these, all these different workers that could share and talk to the same data with incredibly high precision, very fast, and threat safe. And what actually Atomics did is they allowed for those high resolution precision time based attacks to happen directly in the, in the browser. And no, but literally said, here, here's the key to the castle. And so it was a really cool idea, except, that, ex except for this. And so uh, very rapidly, so the way the TG39 spec works right, uh, is, is yeah, all throughout the year, every couple of months, TC39, which is the, the committee that decides when new things are added to the ECMAS script spec every year, they get together and meet, and then every January, whatever has reached what's called stage four, means it's gone through the whole process of development, and stage four features become part of the ECMAScript spec, which means they become part of JavaScript. So they approved it in January uh, of, of last year, and then by, uh, and then they started rolling it out, you started seeing it really come into browsers implementing it throughout the course of the year, and like two months later, all these reports started coming in, and all of the browsers disabled it completely. By like January, February of this year, they'd all turned it off. So the Chrome team, Google, has actually been working on it, and they were the first ones to turn it back on, uh, like in June or July maybe of this year. And so the, the browsers, the stakeholders in the industry are trying to solve these problems. And so it's not universally available yet. Like I don't think Safari supports these at all, uh, the, the shared byte arrays and the atomics. But, uh, but Chrome does, I believe Firefox does now as well. So they're coming back. So be aware of it, but if you need it, uh, I'm sorry, but you can't use it quite yet. So, that said, and I don't know we're doing on time, but I think we're probably getting something close. So, what I want everyone to do basically is just play around with these things. Like very few people raised their hands and I said, who has worked with or seen or used web workers? Like very few people, and this is a nine-year-old thing. Because we don't hear about it, we don't think about it. 
Um, there are places where if you really think through, you might identify issues where you can actually improve the performance of your web application and do more things with these tools that have been available all along. Okay. Um, and keep an eye on the whole spectrum thing. Because when that comes back, and when they really do solve the problem, because originally they were saying they were just weren't going to solve it and drop it on the floor, but they are fixing it. So when it does come back and become available, there's a whole lot you'll be able to do. So that is all. Thank you very much.